Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our presentation of retaining employees in a tough uh, market. Um, I'm Laura Alanis and Erin McNamara is also on the line. Um, she's, we're going to be talking about various issues regarding that. Um, so just to get started, this is part of the HR Genius webinar um, series. And um, I'm sure some of you already know about HR Genius, um, that there's three different options if you join HR Genius, the Savant level, which gives you, uh, for $79, the legal HR hotline and access to real HR lawyers. So if you have questions about how to deal with employees, um, that's a great one to be able to call into an attorney to kind of you know, help you with some issues that may come up. And then there's a Brainiac level for $99, which includes that talking to um, HR lawyers, but also gives you some model HR documents, um, annual job application reviews, and then, of course, the biggest one, the Genius, which gives you um, the Savant and the Brainiac documents, but in addition, quarterly HR training videos and an annual handbook um, update, which with changing laws these days, that's going to be an important aspect. And so also as part of the HR Genius Program, um, Kevin has been started this um, podcast. Um, so Topsico is now offering my HR podcast where Kevin and his guests dive into legal, practical, and best practices of complex and day-to-day -day HR issues. And you can find those um, podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play. So we hope you also turn into tune into those podcasts because they give you some valuable tips on these various things. I think one of the last ones we recently did is about reasonable accommodation and animals in the workplace. And so those are really good things to help um, with the changing environment with HR. All right, so what are we doing today? So today we're going to talk about um, employee retention in today's market recruiting for employee retention. We're also going to be talking about offering competitive benefits. And then lastly, uh, structuring, uh, job structuring and workplace policies and theories of employee discipline. Okay, Erin, so why don't we get started with talking about employee retention in today's market. Great. Well, thank you, Laura, for that introduction. Um, so employee retention really begins with recruiting um, the right people. And so, you know, we'll go through a bit about how are you bringing on employees who are going to be here long term. Um, and we'll also look at what it is that's causing people to leave, um, what industries are at risk, and when and why people are leaving. So I'll go over a little bit of data for you first, just to put this in perspective. Um, so the data shows that 10.9% there's 10.9% turnover worldwide, and it's even higher in the U.S. of 19.3%. Um, that's actually a full percentage point increase in the U.S. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, and over 3.5% increase from 2014, which is incredible. It's an incredible increase in the amount of term turnover. Um, it's highest in tech uh, because just simply the demand um, in today's market at 13.2%, but some other at-risk industries would include retail and consumer products, um, that's 13%, media and entertainment, about 11%, same with professional services and government, education, nonprofit, and also the financial services and insurance and telecommunications markets are at about 10%. Um, now, I understand those are pretty broad categories, and retention would depend on what specific industry you would be within some of those categories, but for the purpose of, of giving you some perspective, those are the industries that tend to have the most turnover. And one of the other staggering statistics that I found is that 52% of work, U.S. workers are planning to job hunt in 20, 2019. And of those 52%, 54 percent were hired less than a year ago. So that seems to suggest that some of your newest employees 
um, whether they be the best or just having trouble adjusting to their new work environment are some of the at, most at-risk employees for your business. Um, hey, Erin, can you speak up just a little bit? I think some of our pe um, people are having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. So, so why are people leaving? Um, can you hear me a little better now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so why are people leaving? So looking at these statistics, it shows that it isn't necessarily based on the amount of money someone's getting. Um, the majority, overwhelming majority, has indicated that they, they left their job because of career development opportunities, meaning that they don't feel that they have opportunity to grow in their preferred job or career in their current workplace. Um, another reason why employees are leaving is because of a work-life balance. So many of today's employees do desire better work-life balance, including more favorable schedules, shorter commute times, and scheduling flexibility. And as you can imagine, with increased technological uh, capabilities in the workplace to work remote or uh, work, say, at 10 p.m. as opposed to 9 a.m., you know, some professions, depending on what your daily tasks are, might be more suited for for working um, more flexibly, more flexibility in a work schedule. Um, another reason why employees are leaving is because of manager behavior. 11% um, of employees cited unprofessional or unsupportive managers as the reason why that they wanted to leave their job. Uh, finally, the less frequently cited reasons were well-being, meaning personal or family health issues, and also compensation and benefits, which seems like it would be a really important reason for people to be at their jobs. Um, actually, pay was cited more often than benefits as a reason why people were leaving. But still, I think this shows how important it is to people to have more than just a good pay in their, in their workplace. Um, some other factors that I think are increase, that are influencing retention are technology increasing the availability of other opportunities and market information. So anyone who has LinkedIn on their phone can just go look and see what other jobs are hiring or can look at Glassdoor and see what do people think of this company and what do people think of other companies. Um, also, social media and search engines and job boards have, have made it easier for, say, recruiters to approach people and, and seek to approach passive job seekers who wouldn't otherwise be sending out applications. Another reason why um, people may be leaving is just given the demand for certain professions. So specifically, user experience designers and embedded software engineers, both in the tech workplace, um, experience over 20% um, of, of their employees' turnover per year. So that's some of the highest numbers. Um, finally, the last two reasons for retail specifically, um, a lot of brick and mortar shops are, are going to e-commerce. Um, and so that suggests that the data says that 35% of people leaving retail um, only 35% of them actually stay in retail, so that seems to suggest that there's just less demand for um, sales employees in retail stores. And finally, the gig economy is influencing this turnover rate. Um, there's an increased demand for project-focused um, work as opposed to long-term careers, particularly in the media and entertainment industry. So, how, what, what questions might a company consider when to help predict um, turnover in, in their new, in employees? Um, some factors that might be causing people to look for jobs are actually kind of counterintuitive. So um, there's data su to suggest that the anniversary of joining the company or the anniversary of moving into a, a, your current role um, causes people to reflect on um, their job and their satisfaction with their current role. Also, birthdays, which is an interesting um, 
reason, particularly milestone birthdays such as turning 40 or 50 can cause people to reflect on their careers and take action if they're unhappy. And also uh, class reunions. Um, the data says job hunting drops, jumps 16% after a class reunion. So that seems to show that it's not just what happens at work, it's also what happens in someone's personal life that determines when he or she decides to look for a new job. So one thing an employer can also do to help predict which employees are thinking about leaving is, is use technology to help identify patterns um, in their employees or behavior that would seem to indicate that someone's looking for a new job. So for example, if you can see that someone's using a work computer to spend time on job websites or even opening or responding to unsolicited, unsolicited emails from recruiters or uh, career websites. Um, large companies have also begun tracking badge swipes to see when employees leaving or um, de detecting patterns that might suggest that the employee's interviewing. And some companies have even hired outside firms like JobRate to monitor employee social media activity um, for indication, indications that they might be looking for a new job. Um, so for example, you could see on LinkedIn who is the person connecting with. Are they connecting with other recruiters or people you know, in the same profession? Like that might be um, an indication that they're looking elsewhere. And so that type of technology and tracking has been compared to how for example, credit, credit scoring can predict whether um, consumers will fail to repay loans. So you can use that data to your advantage to help predict patterns. Um, the other thing that companies are doing is using that data to help figure out which employees to target and to recruit to, to their companies. So it's really interesting um, the way that technology is influencing not only people leaving, but also recruitment as well. So why should we care about retaining employees? Um, most importantly, um, it, it is costly. Um, the economic cost of replacing an employee averages between six and nine months of the employee's salary. Um, it can also basically double. It just depends on what the position is, what the skills that are required. Um, so it really it really can be costly, especially if you have a job that requires um, specific skills, um, critical thinking that you would have a smaller pool of candidates for. Um, and so if you're curious in more information about how to figure out the cost of turnover, there are some like turnover calculators available online. You can just plug in some information and um, figure out you know, what exactly the cost is to you. So other soft costs that you might have would be lowered productivity because you have to take the time to train, uh, recruit new employees. Um, it puts more burden on your other employees so that they're not able to do um, their job quite as well. It can also cause uh, decreased engagement of, of your employees that are remaining because you know, they may be reflecting on their happiness with the company as well. Um, not to mention that any customer service errors that you might have um, in trying to train someone new to deal with an ongoing matter or um, trying to pick up where someone else left off. Um, and finally, it certainly just takes a cultural impact as well in your workplace if you have pe it's just a revolving door of people. So moving on to benefits, um, payoff, it's, the data shows that the payoff is, is worth the investment in making, developing strategies to increase your retention. Um, you have the reduced acquisition and training time. You have dedicated company experts. People have been there for years and they know what it is that you do. They have relationships with your clients and they know how to help them. Um, overall, you have increased productivity and quality of work. It's the increasing returns model that your longer employees are going to be more productive. Um, and then you also encourage higher morale and a better customer experience. 
So, Erin, now that we've kind of talked about the importance of retaining uh, good employees, can you give us some strategies on how to retain those kind of employees? Yeah, so like I said, it starts with recruiting. You have to recruit the right people and set them up for success in order to develop a relationship that's going to retain people. So it really starts with the employer. Um, it starts with your job description. Um, you need to make sure that the, the skills necessary for the position are adequately described. Um, along with the type of environment that the candidates should expect so that people understand what it, the position is and you're getting better responses, uh, applications from people who are going to be qualified for the position. Um, because if you don't have an accurate job description, you run the risk of disappointing a qualified candidate by not delivering on the promises or hiring candidates who don't have the proper skill sets to be successful. And so the next thing that you really want to do is identify aspects of culture that you want to emphasize in your workplace and seek those in your candidates. If you have a workplace that, that values focused, hard work on a daily basis, you don't want to look for someone who's going to be um, overly disruptive and unable to um, maintain independent work. So you got to really assess what it is that you are looking for in your workplace and seek that out in your candidates as well. So some some things that uh, tend to make employees more long-term um, employees would be those who stayed at prior jobs, which makes sense. Um, interestingly, also employees who have played team sports tend to be more um, long-term, along with employees who do committed volunteering outside of the workplace. So those are some, some factors that you can look for. Job hoppers generally tend to be a gamble just because they could be looking for the right place to land or they could be difficult to retain. And so that's really just a case-by-case -case basis where you'd have to look at, okay, has this person been at five different jobs in the last five years? Like that might be a red flag. Um, but, you know, it does tend to happen when people are starting out in their career, so maybe they're just looking for the right spot. Another thing that you can do is hire outside of traditional profiles. Um, inexperienced or imperfect backgrounds, um, those people can be trained. And so one thing I thought was interesting is Google, Apple, and IBM, they've all started ditching college degree requirements in favor of hands-on experience. That's an example of hiring outside of traditional profiles. So. Laura, what are your thoughts on these qualities and some of these companies that are starting to move in the direction of di ditching college degree requirements? So, I mean, what kind of the, why those companies are doing that is they're focusing on the actual job itself and the skill sets for a job. So, for example, if you um, are looking for people with college degrees, that excludes whole people that uh, may actually do a better job um, because they actually have the skill set you need. Just because somebody has an English degree doesn't necessarily translate into every single job category. Maybe you need somebody with more technical skills um, that you know, somebody with an English degree may not be able to give you. So, I mean, what that tells me is companies are really focusing on what skill sets do I need? Because the skill sets are what's important because that's going to be the part that gets you the employee that you need that can actually do your job. So I think focusing on that kind of helps make a better hire. Okay. So, you know, once you've got this great candidate and you've decided to bring them on, they accept, you know, the next thing that you need to do to set them up to stay for a long-term period is, is to train them. Um, the data shows that 40% of the employees who receive poor training leave within the first year. So that's a largely preventable thing if you have a qualified person, you know, to set them up for success by giving them the resources and the training that they need to do well. Um, because otherwise, you, you leave your employees feeling unprepared to perform their essential jobs functions. 
So, for example, in call centers, um, sometimes there's pressure to compress training and, and programs into quick periods so that new hires can begin handling calls quickly. Um, and so the, the transition time is generally very short, um, and the training is quick and packed full of information, um, which can cause turnover. But one way that they've started to manage this is to create a longer transition period between training and independent job performance. And another thing that, that they've done is started um, creating an operating environment with higher supervisor to employee ratios to help ensure that employees have the support and direction and guidance that they need to perform well. And so, Obviously, when, when you start with your new employee, they're going to go through their orientation process, but then we'd also suggest that you do onboarding, which is not necessarily a standalone event, but part of a more comprehensive process to integrate the employee into the company culture and, and have them really equipped to hit the ground running with their job. So during this time, you want to make sure that you're clarifying company expectations and policies. Um, during your first week, go over the company basics, like your products and services, size and organization, general industry, um, important people, and a mentoring program if you have them. Um, you'd want to teach your new hires about the company culture and discuss the opportunities for growth and development that they would have there. And another key part about your onboarding is to make sure that you're following up with those employees. So you should have supervising managers meeting with employees at certain points, maybe two weeks after their first day or a month, two, two months after, um, to ask the new team members how things are going and if they understand the business and their role and if they have any questions that haven't been answered. And another thing you can do at this time is ask if the training programs have been helpful, uh, have they addressed the right areas, get some feedback, um, to figure out if the employees are getting the resources they, they need or if they'd like something else that's not being offered. And so it's important to allow the feedback so that you can improve your programs and also those employees can feel like they have a say and, and you have an opportunity to address any questions that they might have. And so in addition to the onboarding, mentorship programs have also been shown to be an effective tool for promoting retention. Um, so one study conducted by Deloitte in 2016 found that millennials um, planning to stay with their employer for more than five years were twice as likely to have a mentor. They were 68% more likely than not. So this seems to be a very important um, tool, especially for millennials. And so one thing I would suggest in developing these mentoring programs is approaching it with a different philosophy than a traditional like mentoring where you have someone who's instructing someone else how to do their job. It's more of kind of a mutually beneficial process where you're helping integrate someone to into the environment. Um, they're feeling comfortable. They have a back sounding board for ideas. Um, and also, you know, kind of like networking, developing relationships with people and strengthening relationships that you have with existing employees by allowing them to make a new connection. Um, and so in developing these mentorship programs, it's important to thoughtfully match your mentors and mentees so that people can get value out of, out of the program. Um, it shouldn't normally be a, a supervisor because that would interfere with the ability to be a sounding board and really integrate into the company culture. So um, if possible, it would be good to match new mentees with mentors in other areas of the company and even give them an, an opportunity to learn about um, the diversity of the company. Another thing, if, if you don't have the resources for um, individualized mentor program would be mentoring circles for small group discussions. Um, can be a, they've become a more popular option for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring as well. Um, so you gather a number of people and talk about preset, top, preset topics um, selected based on your company's industry or particular department's respons responsibilities. So Laura, I wanted to ask you, do you think mentoring, what do you think about mentoring 
for new, relatively inexperienced employees versus also for experienced new hires that may be coming to the company with 10 plus years of experience? So my thoughts on that are, you know, obviously the newer employees are trying to just get into the job market. Um, we'll need some mentoring on, you know, just trying to the work environment. Um, and so that's beneficial to new employees, but also for new employees that may have experience, um, the part of the mentoring is really teaching the employee about the company and the company culture. So having a mentor, even for somebody that may be experienced but is new to the company, is helpful in allowing that employee um, to kind of be more, to understand the company culture, um, and so m maybe they have questions on just how the company works or who they should go to for certain aspects. And having that mentor um, to help guide them, I think, helps integrate a new employee, whether they're just fresh from the um, out of school to ones that have more experience, kind of merging them into the company culture. So I actually do think it's important to have mentors um, for, for both of those areas. And also, um, one thing just kind of on the legal aspect that you probably should worry about is having mentors just for the younger employees versus maybe somebody who's more experienced and you know, older, that may, could give rise to a potential um, age discrimination claim. But I mean, I think overall it's beneficial for new employees coming in regardless of, you know, how long they've been in the workplace, just to kind of get them to be merged into that company culture. Yeah, that's definitely a great point about making sure that it's offered to all employees. All right, so now that um, we, we've been talking about uh, recruiting and um, various other things, so let's talk about um, offering competitive benefits. Um, what suggestions do you have for that, Erin? So first off, as we saw in the reasons why people are leaving, professional development. Um, it goes hand in hand with promotional opp opportunities. People feel like the company's investing in them and investing in their career and their future. Um, polls say that 59% of millennials rank this as extremely important. So, you know, this is the number one place for a company to focus its efforts in order to increase retention. Um, it could include educational reimbursement, on-site training, student loan assistance. Um, some other approaches might be a little more informal, like meeting with the employee or, or having feedback from them on their skills, knowledge, and interests, and helping your employees establish a timeline for reaching career goals and identifying the resources that they need to do so. Um, so they could, you could offer resources such as short-term training, mentoring, or other formal education like pursuing a, a degree. Um, so another thing you can do with on a more technical basis is just have meetings. You could do encourage you can do skip level meetings where the employee meets with the manager, but also the manager's supervisor, so that you have. Um, a perspective from a higher level um, with the employee and allow for a broader, more long-term career discussion than typical mentoring. And so finally, with the professional development, another thing that you really need to encourage is continual feedback. This is something that has also been ranked very important to the younger generation, is to get feedback on their performance. Um, and work product. So transitioning a bit to other more traditional benefits such as leave. Um, we certainly are approaching a um, time where there's a push and a pull between the paid and unpaid leave for employees. Um, and so really when you're develop there are a lot of options that you could have in developing these policies. Um, but in order to promote retention, the really your goal should be to provide some choice and flexibility while also rewarding good work and tenure. 
So some options that you could have would be floating holidays. Um, this is something that Microsoft employees report that they really like. Um, they like there's no waiting 90 days for these benefits to be available, and with floating holidays, you're not locked into taking vacation uh, at a time, arbitrary holiday what, that is meaningless. They can instead take a day off when it truly benefits them. Um, another option would be increasing your vacation time with tenure. Um, so you can incentivize your employees to um, stay longer and accrue more pay time off um, which, uh, with every year that they work for your company. So for example, you could, if you offer three weeks of vacation for any new employees, you could bump that up to five weeks of vacation for any employee with the company for five years and then uh, increase to another, at another 10 years of employment, um, something like that that promotes employees to stay with your company long term. Um, another option that some companies have started to offer, for example, Google, um, employees can take up to three months of unpaid sabbatical, which is very interesting. Um, and then at Adobe, em employees can take a paid sabbatical of every five years. Um, so the intention behind a program like that would be to allow the employee to reset and come back refreshed and ready to you know, continue with their work because we all get a little tired sometimes. Another um, option that's been discussed is um, allowing employees to buy and sell um, paid time off. So this is something that employees at American Express do. They can buy and sell their vacation time this year, and that's something that has gotten some really good feedback. Um, and, you know, most extreme, um, I saw Netflix has offered unlimited vacation for its employees um, since 2004. So that's, that's a very extreme policy that I'm sure not a lot of employers would have. Um, and the feedback has been that there's a high level of accountability at Netflix that um, requires employee, employees to keep their managers on notice of their plans, um, and it's developed a level of trust that tends to simulate better focus at work. So, Laura, what do you think about some of these pol uh, policies and, you know, what concerns would you have for an employer considering um, a super employee-friendly um, policy like, say, unlimited vacation days? Yeah, so my concern would be for employers that are a lot smaller, that don't, have, they're not the Googles or not the Microsoft that may have a lot of redundancies in position, um, they may not be able to really allow their employees to have this unlimited sick and vacation time, especially if uh, that employee is working and is part of a team which requires collaboration um, and that particular employee has a uh, a specific job function that nobody else does, and then that employee's off for six months to a year or is taking multiple vacation time um, without really checking in, I think it may be hard for that type of um, leave to really work in that kind of environment. So honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that some of these are really good for employees, but for employers, depending on your size, a lot of employers may not be able to allow this just because um, they, they just don't have the same resources that the bigger companies do. Yeah, and I would definitely be concerned as well if what the culture would be like at some of those companies um, where you have like uh, unlimited sick or vacation time, but yet you know you're not you're expected you're held accountable. So some people might feel like they can't actually use the policy. Um, unlimited t vacation time is an extreme example, but say if you had a company that had maybe like a month of vacation time, you know you want to make sure that your work culture is such that employees feel comfortable to use those benefits that you offer, whether it be telework or vacation time or whatever it is. Yeah, and I've heard an example of where um, 
in one particular company, they, they were allowing um, multiple people to take leaves off at the same time. And so when that happened, other people had to take on their um, job functions and were really feeling overloaded because you had these other employees that were taking months off and they were having to, you know, step up and take over their job functions. So it could, I mean, as I think you mentioned, could be hard on other employees that um, aren't able to take off those months at a time. And I'm sure depends on the industry as well because not every employer is going to be well suited to have people just taking off whenever. But yeah, I mean, I think certainly you send a message about your work-life balance, you know, with your policies but also with your uh, culture in allowing people to take advantage of those policies. So in addition to that, you also need to be mindful of the actual legally required leave. So I mentioned here unlimited sick and vacation time. Well, you also have the FMLA requirements. Um, and in some, Texas is actually starting to implement some local paid sick leave laws. Now, they're, they're being challenged now currently, um, but it, it is a concern for employers moving forward um, to be mindful of other legal requirements for paid or unpaid leave. And so that segues in a bit to caregiver leave. So when I say caregiver leave, um, I'm using that term differently than family or parental leave. So when I say parental leave, I'm really talking about maternity and paternity leave for birth or adoptive parents to care for a new child. Um, when I say family leave, I mean leave to care for an immediate family member, such as a spouse, child, or a parent. Um, and caregiver is more is the broadest language, including the leave leave to care for someone outside of that particular spouse, child, parent category, perhaps a sibling that you may need to care for, or um, someone not necessarily blood related. So. Um, there's been a lot of evidence that paid caregiver leave increases um, talent attraction and retention. Um, so most recently, um, there's been studies that show that paid family leave increases retention, especially among women. Um, so for example, when Google expanded its parental leave policy from 12 weeks to 18 weeks in 2007, the retention rate for women post-maternity leave increased by 50%, um, which is incredible. And so when, similarly, when Aetna expanded its, expanded its maternity leave policy, the percentage of women returning to work there jumped from 77% to 91%. So that really seems to suggest that um, parental, well-crafted parental leave policies do incentivize um, people to stay with the company, particularly after um, childbirth. Um, but one thing that you want to be careful in offering and, dra and crafting your parental um, or family leave policies would be this, how you're structuring it. So, for example, you may need to structure a medically ne necessary policy for women, say, following childbirth, that would need to be structured differently than, say, uh, caregiving leave for both parents to bond with the child. Um, some policies I've seen have used language such as primary or secondary caregiver, um, which the problem with that isn't necessarily in the way it's drafted, but perhaps in the way that it's implemented. So actually recently J.P. Morgan um, settled a huge lawsuit um, with dads. It was $5 million um, for a group, a class action of dads that brought a lawsuit um, saying that J.P. Morgan HR department wasn't um, fairly, imp imp was implementing their primary, secondary caregiver policy in a discriminatory manner because essentially the men were being requested to prove that they were the primary caregiver um, to provide documentation. Essentially, HR was giving them a hard time when they were trying to claim that primary caregiver um, leave. So that's definitely something to be careful of. Um, and you just ultimately really need to make sure that your policy is, is well crafted. Um, but I think 
it, the studies show that allowing um, generous caregiver leave benefits really um, helps retain new mothers, um, not only allowing it for new moms, but also for new dads. Um, and as, as some have put it, it's actually the one work, workplace quality, um, policy that actually perpetuates gender equality because it perpetuates the belief that women will take a long leave um, that can lead to things like bias and hiring pay and promotions when you have unequal benefits for new moms versus new dads, or even being mindful of um, same-sex couples um, dealing with that issue in a non-discriminatory way. So lots of nuances to caregiver leave and structuring those policies, and it really is a hot area right now. So moving on to salary, bonuses, and promotions. So obviously one of the best ways to combat turnover is to ensure that pay in your organization is externally competitive and also internally equitable. Um, so you, you, know, you not only want to make sure that your pay is competitive in the market, but people are going to be unhappy even if they're being paid a lot, if their coworkers are being paid more and they don't feel like they're being treated fairly. So providing competitive salaries can really discourage people from money-motivated job hop hopping. So not only can you do an act increase the actual salary, but you could consider other options such as stock options or financial awards for employees who um, exceed performance goals or stay for a certain amount of time, um, say like a bonus if you're there a certain number of years. Um, in addition to those monetary rewards, um, it's also been effective to have um, rec internal recognition processes um, such as, say, you can recognize your employees on social media for good work or peer-to-peer um, -peer recognition platform that allows peers to give each other feedback um, on work. Um, those have shown to be uh, help promote retention. And so another way that companies are starting to think about benefits is allowing employees to customize them um, because employees have shown that they want flexibility, choice, and non-traditional options. So, for example, buying and banking benefits um, are one non-traditional option, um, which helps employees who may be underserved by traditional financing options or who want access to services that aren't generally available. So when I say that, I mean pay cards, short-term loans, employee purchase programs, employee discount programs, et cetera, flexible spending accounts, those types of benefits. Um, you could also offer lifestyle and convenience benefits um, that allow an employee to take advantage of cost savings that they wouldn't otherwise get um, because they're getting benefits from their employer. So when I say lifestyle and convenience benefits, I mean child care, elder care, pet insurance, auto insurance, um, things like that. And then you can offer personal care and improvement benefits. Uh, meaning financial counseling, wellness programs, employee assistance programs, and tuition assistance. And then finally, you can offer financial safety nets, um, such as home warranty insurance, homeowner's insurance, identity theft prote protection, and things like that. So there's a variety of ways that you can offer bene benefits to employees that are more than just an increased salary. And it's been shown that a lot of these non employees actually want a lot of these non-traditional benefits as well. Thanks, Erin. So, you know, we, we've been talking about, you know, kind of the onboarding and the and benefits, but one of the other ways to help retain employees is job structuring and workplace policies. So, Erin, can we talk a little bit about um, what employers can do to change the job structure and their workplace policies to help retain employees? Yeah. So, first of all, you can thoughtfully design a job to help control retention. Um, and so 
what I mean by that is focusing on the most important skills for and tasks that come with a certain position and unbundling them from less valuable skills or um, tasks that would be easier to um, delegate to someone who might not have as strict of um, skills needed for, for that position. So for instance, UPS um, had this issue with some of their drivers. They recognized that they were they knew the routes well. It was really important that they retain the drivers, but they were having a hard time um, retaining them. And it, when it studied the reasons why its drivers were leaving, they it turns out they didn't like unloading and loading loading the packages at the beginning of the run. So what UPS did is they made a separate position for, for that loading task and the turnover rate for drivers fell dramatically. So that's an example of how you can think critically about what tasks you're including with a particular job. Um, another thing you can do is actually place a term limit on certain positions that have a historically high turnover. Um, so this is an issue that was faced by Wall Street investment firms with um, junior analysts. Um, they would leave pretty much pretty regularly at about three three years. So, well, it was erratic. But um, what they did is they ended up placing a limit for for those analysts to leave after three years. So it was one way that the company was able to control the retention the turnover as opposed to. Um, trying to reduce it altogether. So that's another approach that you can take to um, dealing with the problem of retention. And so another another way that you can structure a job to promote retention is to allow a leadership rotation program so that employees can spend time in different areas of the company and get more experience, um, which may encourage them to stay for a longer term. Um, especially among millennials um, who desire that well-rounded experience. And so similarly, you can think about job customization as well, which means really tailoring job to what the employee's interests and um, skill set. And so while this may not be available for every position, it's, it's a, um, something to think about Prudential, for example, is experimenting with this type of program. Um, it allows the workers to, it, it gives them tools to help assess their own interests, values, and skills, and then encourages its managers to tailor rewards, benefits, and assignments to those individual requirements. Um, and so that could look like a part-time arrangement. Um, it could look like tuition reimbursement, um, but ultimately gives employees um, some say and um, allows them an opportunity to have a direction in their own career development. So just as a legal side note, you want to make sure that if you have any sort of customization program like this, that it's implemented across the board rather than selectively. Um, first of all, you're going to have a morale problem if some employees are getting the opportunity to customize their benefits or their, their job. Um, but also, you could have, it could give rise to discrimination claims. So that's something to, to be cautious of. Um, so another thing that has shown, been shown to be very important to employees is um, the opportunity for flexible work. Um, companies supporting remote work have 25% lower employee turnover. And so when I'm talking about flexible work schedules, um, there are, I really am talking about three different options, so flex time, part time, and um, compressed work week. So when I say flex time, I mean that the employer really doesn't care when you get to work. You come and go as long as you work the required number of hours um, and get your work done. So obviously that, that would be hard for some industries, um, but it is a valuable um, tool for some employees who really desire that flexibility. Um, another setup would be part-time where you have um, scheduled hours but it's not the traditional nine to five work day. 
Um, and it allows people who have other obligations or other interests to take the time to, um, you know, have the time to, to do those while also maintaining their job um, in your workplace. And then finally, um, compressed work weeks, um, which is similar to flex time, but would allow an employee to work, say, 10-hour days during four days a week, and then they get Friday off. Um, but with all of those, you also have to be mindful of labor laws, specifically the Fair Labor Standards Act, because if you have remote employees, um, you need to make sure that they are getting paid for their overtime, so just make sure your overtime policies are clear as well. Um, and that's something that really will be hit on in our next webinar with uh, avoiding legal issues with remote employees. And so finally, you really want to make sure that you're creating an environment with transparency and open communication. Um, if you have honest, honest ethical leaders, they're going to set exa the example for your employees. Um, and allowing this open communication between employees and management can help you address problems before they really become a huge problem um, raised in a lawsuit. All right, Erin, thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that can affect um, how we can retain some good employees is the way employers discipline their employees. So Erin, why don't I first start kind of talking about the different theories of employee discipline, and then we can talk about what works and what doesn't. Go ahead. Sure. So enforcing your discipline policy is often casual in a small business um, but it really is important to have a clear discipline program to help prevent litigation. Um, so the elements of your program, you're going to have a code of conduct that employees know what's expected of you. Um, they know also the consequences for not following those rules. And it's important that, that those procedures for dealing with violations are standardized um, so that employees know the steps and, um, you know, they know the progression as well. Um, you can also offer an appeal procedure for employees to voice their side of the story. Um, and I don't necessarily mean like a full hearing and, you know, right to, but to allow them the opportunity to respond is, is important. And then finally, um, when you have your discipline program, you need to make sure that you're not altering the at-will employment status of your employees. Um, you would have, if you have a written policy, you need to include a statement that the policy is guidance and you reserve the right to modify the policy in any way, um, et cetera. And so in going through this discipline policy, you need to make sure that it's documented. It's important for all of these steps to be documented um, so that the employee is on notice and that you have record of of what steps have been covered. So in a typical progressive discipline system, you have oral warnings, written warnings, then you have suspension, and then termination. Um, after a certain time period, maybe six months or a year, the employee can get a clean slate, and then a new infraction would start the process all over again. But then there are some steps that would obviously warrant um, skipping the progressive steps. So for example, carrying a weapon at work, theft, intentional harassment, destruction of property, these are behaviors that are commonly excluded from a progressive discipline approach and may be subject to immediate discharge. But if you have an employee that's engaged in some of this behavior that is that they should be immediately terminated for, it's important for you to do an investigation first to figure out what happened, give them an opportunity to explain, and um, at that point then follow through if, if that's needed. And so another important point about the, the discipline policy is making sure that it, it sets the right tone for your workplace culture. You're establishing a foundation of fairness, putting employee on notice of the problem and an opportunity to change the behavior. And really your goal should be to educate the employee rather than to punish them and to help end the unacceptable behavior while also retaining the employee as a productive member. Um, some legal considerations that you might have for your progressive discipline policy. Um, you want to ensure that it's written and actually followed in practice. Um, you could have a problem if your 
doing all of this policy and documenting for one employee, but you, you have others who aren't being um, disciplined for the same violations. You could have um, discrimi discrimination claims. Um, so in, in following the process, you need to make sure that the documentation is completed and any necessary follow-up is completed um, and that you're actually preserving that inform information and in a confidential manner in your file as well. So the last thing that we're going to talk about today is the tips and tactics for developing effective retention strategies. So Erin, what tips do you have for our audience today for developing effective retention strategies? So to start, I would encourage, again, open communication, listening to your employee feedback while they're still on staff. Don't wait for your exit interviews. You can conduct stay interviews where you ask questions like, what makes you look forward to going to work? What do you like most about working here? Um, what would tempt you to leave? Ask those questions of your best employees while they're still there so that you can make sure that you're um, creating an environment that makes people want to be there. Um, you can also use technology to send the questions and allow people to respond um, anonymously or um, it may just encourage more um, candid responses that way as opposed to a direct meeting um, with an employee. Um, but you can also use data and history from your company to see what types of positions um, are experiencing turnover and looking at the aggregate, why, why are people leaving? It could help you identify if you have a management problem or um, some other issue that could be addressed. And so in implementing your retention strategies, as I mentioned earlier, your aim really should be to control turnover rather than to stop it all together. Some positions are just going to have turnover. And so if you can do something like structure the job so that you can better control it or um, set a time limit to control the turnover, those are, those are good options for dealing with that type of problem. Um, and the data has definitely shown that it's better to prevent, address attrition with preemptive intervention than to make a counteroffer when an employee is going to leave. Um, it shows 50% of employees who accept a counteroffer actually end up leaving in 12 months. So it really doesn't do you any good to uh, make a counter offer once the employee is already going to leave. Um, so in offering all these policies and benefits and job customization development opportunities, you need to make sure that they're offered uniformly and that discipline is implied, applied uniformly. Um, and you know, in implementing op these options, know that they've been shown to, they're proven retention strategies. Um, but you do need to go back and reassess employee data to make sure that it's, that it's effective. So again, kind of as a recap, it starts with who you are recruiting. Um, recruit the right people. Um, give your employees flexibility and choice that goes a long way in helping retain them um, to the extent that you can. And you need to clearly communicate expectations and at the same time be responsive to employee feedback. So I guess at this time, if I have any questions, we can address those. Okay, um, not seeing any questions. Um, if you, if anyone thinks of anything um, later on, please feel free to email us, and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. So anyway, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And Erin, thank you so much for that useful information. Um, and next webinar is telecommuting, avoiding legal issues with remote employees. So we hope you join us for that one as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll sign off. Thank you. Let us know if you have any questions.